Well, good morning again. It's nice to nice to see you all. So yeah, we're coming to the the climax of John's gospel. Although lots of people think that the crucifixion in John's account is is his climax, but I wondered, have you ever considered or had the experience of coming into a place or a scenario or a situation where you know as soon as you walk in that something's happened, that something has occurred, and yet you have absolutely no idea what has actually happened? Has anyone had that experience before? I'll give you an example. Um, it happens quite a lot at the moment with our daughter, Sienna. Uh, she's five months, and she's a good kid most of the time. She, um, uh, you know, is uh, fairly quiet, as someone remarked a couple of weeks ago. But every so often, rarely, maybe, maybe, maybe less than rarely nowadays, uh, she gets a bit grumpy. She gets a bit grisly, a bit frantic. Uh, sometimes she's just generally unhappy. And just to look at her, you know... Something's happened. Something's happened to her. Something's going on. Now, as a parent, you can diagnose. I'm sure parents will sympathize with me on this one. Is she hungry? Is she tired? Does she have a hair tourniquet around her toe? Yeah, all of these things we have to diagnose. But actually, we can try loads of different things, and we don't actually know what on earth has happened. And then an hour later, we're doing a routine nappy change, and oh, that's what it was. An hour ago, she's done a mess in a nappy, and we completely missed it. We curse ourselves. Why didn't we see the signs or smell the signs, as the case may be? Now, uh, that's kind of a seamless segue, maybe, into the fact that that is what the remaining 11 disciples experienced on Jesus' day of resurrection. Something has happened, but they have absolutely no idea what has actually happened. Now, John is the only gospel to record uh, Jesus' male disciples going to the tomb. All of the other synoptic gospels have the women going to the tomb, hearing from uh, the angels that Jesus has risen, and then them coming and giving their testimony to the male disciples. Uh, and what happens usually, what happens in the other Gospels when, when the disciples hear this from the women is they have utter disbelief. So Luke 24, 11, for example, these words seemed to them an idle tale and they did not believe them. Mark 16, 11 says, when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, that's Mary Magdalene, they would not believe it. However, what we have in our passage is we have John recording Simon Peter and the disciple whom Jesus loved run to the empty tomb on the testimony of Mary Magdalene. What I realized when I looked at this passage in John 20 is this. They have absolutely no idea what has happened when they get to that empty tomb. I used to read this passage and think, oh, the disciples have got it. They've gone, they've, they've trusted the women and they've gone along to the tomb and they've seen that it's empty. Oh, of course Jesus must have risen. But that's not what we see at all. Simon Peter and the beloved disciple, they run to the tomb and they investigate what has happened. It says that they stoop to look in. They see the linen cloths lying there. They see the face cloth for Jesus' face folded neatly by the side. And in verse 8, it says that the other disciple, when he enters the tomb and sees all this, it says that he saw and believed. But shall I tell you what he saw and believed? He saw and believed that something had happened. But did he believe that Jesus had risen triumphantly from the dead? Did Simon Peter believe that? I would say, dear friends, no. They did not have a clue. What they saw is similar to what Mary Magdalene thought. They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. We know that the disciples didn't have a clue, because the very next day, as we read in Luke's gospel, Simon Peter is walking with Cleopas along the road to Emmaus. And Luke's gospel records this, that they were looking sad, 
So sad that they don't even recognize the risen Jesus walking alongside them. They even say to him these words. Moreover, some of our company, uh, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning. And when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Now, some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. So the disciples, as we read in John 20, had gone to the tomb on the testimony of women, had seen all of the things that they described, but could not make the connection that Jesus had risen from the dead. And that's why Jesus rebukes them in that passage in Luke. Oh, foolish ones and slow of heart. So what had actually happened on that morning? John 20 verse 9, if you look in your Bible, says exactly what the foolish disciples were missing. So let's look together. For as yet... They did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Now, the rest of this message is going to focus on that verse, verse 9. It's the key to solving the problem that Mary elaborates to the disciples. They've taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Something's happened to Jesus. We don't know where he is. Maybe grave robbers have taken him. Maybe the Roman guards or the Jewish teachers of the law. Where is he? Verse 9 solves this mystery for us. Now, in particular, I'm going to focus on three things in the second part of the verse, that he must rise from the dead. But before I do that, I just want to focus on the first bit. For as yet they did not understand the scripture. That's why the disciples failed to make the connection for what was happening to Jesus. Why his triumphant rise from the grave was missed by Simon and the other disciple. And why, because of it, they still went away from the tomb feeling sad and dejected. I think that part of the passage serves as instruction to us. We need to ensure, brothers and sisters, that we are steeped in the scriptures, that we are saturated by God's holy word. Because we can't afford to miss what God has done and what God is doing in this world to restore it and to restore our broken lives. Thank God that Jesus took mercy on the disciples, even when they failed to understand what was going on. Thank God that he took mercy by appearing to them afterwards, as we'll look later on in subsequent messages on John's gospel. Jesus appears to them. That's why I think sometimes Thomas gets a bad rap for being the one who is seen always as doubting, because all of the other 10 disciples did exactly the same thing. How sad would it be if you were the one who when something happened, when the light dawned, when Jesus rose from the, from the dead, you would be the one scrabbling around still in the dark. We need to be steeped in the scriptures. And this isn't just ensuring that you have a regular time of, of Bible study or relying on your old covenant as memory verses perhaps or Sunday school classes. Do you seek the wisdom of the Lord when you open up his holy word? Do you ask him when we read our Bibles to reveal more of his glory to you? Does the word impact your daily life? Where you not only hear the commands of Jesus, but we obey them as well. Do you apply God's holy scriptures to your life? Because if we look at the two groups here, we've got Simon Peter, and then we've got the women at the tomb. Who is likely to have read more of the scriptures? It's probably going to be Simon Peter. He was quite a, a, a Jewish teacher's pet, I would say. And yet, in all four Gospels, the people who are honored as having found the empty tomb and believe the testimony of the angels is the women. Not only that, Peter is rebuked for his lack of faith. 
That is what the Bible gives us, friends, if we read it properly, if we ask God to reveal himself to us in his word. This is what we receive. We receive faith in the promises of Jesus. That's why John wrote this gospel, as we've said all the way through this sermon series, that you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. So read your Bibles, not because you have to, but because it will stir your belief, your faith in Christ. It will open your eyes to the greatness of God, that he's risen and now reigns in glory. So that's the first part I wanted to touch on, just that we need to understand the scriptures, not just read them, to understand what has happened in this incredible event. So now I want to take us to the second part. He must rise from the dead. And I want to look at it in three parts. Number one, he must rise from the dead. Number two, he must rise from the dead. And number three, he must rise from the dead. So hopefully that should be quite simple to remember. <laughs> Firstly, the scriptures speak that he, Jesus, must rise from the dead. In this gospel, we already have a person who has risen from the dead, haven't we? We've got Lazarus in John 11. Now, if we've already got an account of a man rising from the dead, what makes Jesus' resurrection so important? Not only that, if you look at Matthew 27, you will see this. The tombs also were opened. This is at the death of Jesus, by the way. And many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. So we've got quite a few people rising from the dead at this point. What makes Jesus's so special? Now, I'm being slightly facetious here because the answer is quite simple. In all of these cases, it is Jesus who is the catalyst for these resurrections. He is the one who makes it all happen. If we go back to John 11, when Lazarus has been in the tomb for four days and Martha is sobbing at the death of her brother, asking the Lord, why haven't you done anything? Jesus says this, I am the resurrection and the life. Without the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, all mankind would remain dead when they die. Dead in their sins, dead in their transgressions, dead in the flesh. But Jesus makes a way by his death and resurrection. In 1 Corinthians 15, which we are going to return to as well, the Apostle Paul, his life has been changed by seeing the risen Jesus on the road to Damascus. He says this in verse 20 of 1 Corinthians 15. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man come death, by a man has also come the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. Without Jesus making a way for us, being the first fruits of resurrection, everything that we would hope for would be futile. The scriptures speak that Jesus must, and it's Jesus must rise from the dead because he makes a way for us to also rise from the dead. Isn't that amazing? He must rise so that we rise with him. Secondly, Jesus must rise from the dead. Why did he need to rise from the dead? Verse 9 in our passage, as uh, I've already touched on, compels us to look to the scriptures for the answer. So let's go to a few places. There are many, but I'm going to touch on only a few. David, for example, in Psalm 16, says this, For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, that's the Hebrew place for the dead, or let your Holy One see corruption. Jesus was the sinless Savior. He was holy and blameless. So his place in the dead 
was only temporary. Death cannot hold something or someone who is sinless, who is holy and blameless, does not deserve that penalty of death. Hosea 6 verses 1 to 2. Now that's speaking of the future of Israel and Judah. But read, read these words when we come. Let us return to the Lord, for he has torn us that he may heal us as he has struck us down. And he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up that we may live before him. We might also consider Jonah, if you remember the story of Jonah. For three days he was in the belly of the fish before God caused him to be raised up onto dry land. Now all of these scriptures, and there are many more, they are just glimpses, foretastes of what is fulfilled in Jesus. Jesus must rise from the dead because all of scripture points to it. Jesus must also rise from the dead because the righteousness of God is given to us not just because of the cross, but it is fully accomplished by Jesus in the resurrection. We know that as Tom preached last Sunday, on the cross, Jesus bore our sins. He paid the penalty that we deserve. So you would think that that's all that's required. But if you have a look at Romans 4, 24, 25, it says this, God's righteousness will be counted to us who believe in him who raised from the dead, Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. So we are justified by God, not just because of the crucifixion, but because Jesus rose from the dead. Hallelujah. Furthermore, Jesus must rise from the dead, and this is really important. Because if he didn't rise from the dead, then all that he said, all that he taught us, would be for nothing. Throughout the Gospels, Jesus predicts his death, but he also predicts that he will rise again from the dead. Even as we look earlier in John's Gospel, as he's talking to the Pharisees, he says, if you destroy this temple in three days, I will raise it up again. The temple, of course, being his body. If this didn't happen, then Jesus is made out to be a liar, pure and simple. Again, in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul states it plain and simple. It's a very famous passage on the, on the resurrection. If Christ has not been in vain, then our preaching is in vain. So I might as well just sit down right now. And your faith is in vain. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those who also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. There will be absolutely be no point in me speaking to you this morning or us singing or us even being here in this building. Now this is important because if someone asks you, why are you a Christian? I imagine that you might give them a myriad of different responses. Perhaps you might say, well, I'm a Christian because I have a relationship with God, which is true. You might say, I'm a Christian because, well, I've grown up in the church. Or you might say, I've always known God. I went to Sunday school. For myself, uh, this is, I, I went to Sunday school and I went to a Church of England school and uh, God has always been there in my life. Perhaps I might say that. Perhaps you might say, I'm a Christian because I follow the teachings of Jesus. All of those responses are valid. But church, this answer needs to be top of the list. I am a Christian because I believe that God raised Christ from the dead. That must be top of our answers. The resurrection is the belief by which the church stands or falls. Pure and simple. He must rise. 
because if he doesn't, all of this is for naught. Now, if this is such an important doctrine for us as Christians, if this is the reason why we are here, because a man, Jesus, was raised from the dead by God, can you defend that when people challenge it? Do you have arguments? Do you have reasons? Do you have things that you can say to defend this point? It's worth considering. Finally, Jesus must rise. Throughout John, we've seen a recurring theme, which is the ascending and descending of Jesus. Okay, if you've missed it, then I, I would invite you to follow that theme. You know, take some time in your devotions. Have a look at John and see the ascending and descending motif that is present throughout this gospel. I'll give you a few examples. John 1 at the very beginning says, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Of course, there, that's a picture of Jacob's ladder. John 6, for I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And later on in John 8, he talks about the Son of Man being lifted up, which of course is referring to his death on the cross. Church, we will never fully comprehend this coming down, this dissension, this humiliation of Jesus. He didn't just descend down like as if you were going down an escalator in a local shopping mall. The eternal word, the Holy One of God, he stepped down from the beauty and glory and heights of heaven itself to take on flesh, the flesh of sinful man, to walk in this broken world. We will never get our heads around the decision that God made to do that, to become incarnate, all because he loves us. And then to face the further humiliation that we heard last week, the scorn of humanity, beatings, floggings, crucifixion, and death. Philippians 2, 5 to 8 famously says this, Have this in mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God something to be grasped, but emptied himself, emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and then being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Total and utter humiliation, more than any of us will ever go through in our lives. But Jesus must rise. His descent was only temporary to save our souls. And the fact that he would descend from heaven to earth makes him worthy of the highest honor. If you carry on reading Philippians 2, you'll see this. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The resurrection of Jesus is the beginning of Christ's rightful ascent back to glory, leading to his ascension to heaven, his seating at the right hand of the Father, and his second coming, this time in glory and majesty and might. On Tuesday, um, Steve and I, we had, we had a Muslim man around in this church. We took him on a tour, and, uh, and he stood in this very hall, and he looked up at the scripture above me, and he asked, why? Why is that up there? Now, as you can imagine, Steve and I were licking our lips in, uh, at this opportunity. So we very dutifully told him, this statement summarizes what Jesus proclaims about himself. This is how we should view our Lord Jesus Christ. The way, the only way to the Father. The only way to salvation from our sins. 
The truth that we can believe that he and his words are true and faithful and good, that we don't need to fear that he will mislead us or tell us lies. And finally, the life that through him, through his death, through his resurrection, we can enjoy abundance of life, not just now, but eternal life with him. So we explained this all to this chap, and, uh, and at the end of it, I asked him, um, do, do you find this offensive? You know, it's quite an exclusive verse, isn't it? I, Jesus, I am the, uh, the way, the only way, the truth and the life. This verse makes the claim for me that, that, the, uh, that the only way is Christianity. But actually, he thought for a minute, and he said, um, he said no, no, it's, it's, it's not offensive to me, because... For us as Muslims as well, Jesus or Isa as a prophet is the way to God. So yeah, I can, I can believe his words are true. And, and I suppose I can believe therefore that those words are life-giving. Dear friends, like Peter, I believe this is an example of someone knowing that something has happened, but having no idea what has actually happened. What we encounter in this passage here in John 20 and what we see throughout John's gospel are the actions of more than a prophet. It's the actions of the God-man come down from heaven to redeem his people, the people whom he created. And therefore, he must rise, exalted, and glorified to be worshipped forever and ever. Just before I finish, I've just got a few sort of closing remarks, really, I suppose, on, how, on what, this out, what the outcome of this passage is for us. The most important, I think, is, is, of course, that we, all of us, can enter into Christ's glorious resurrection if we believe in him, if we call upon the name of the Lord. As he rises we also will rise with him. Hallelujah. This also means that our faith, our faith is in a living God, a God who is alive, one who reigns now and forever. And I think that this should give us courage when we share our faith with others. And perhaps when we have cause to defend our faith, as I mentioned earlier, Our foundation, our main defense for Christianity, all of the apologetic arguments that we can think of, everything must hang on the resurrection of Jesus. Did it happen? If something happened, what did happen? Can you, church, defend the resurrection? Do you believe it in your own hearts? That a man was raised from the dead by God. Search your hearts and seek the Lord. The resurrection is, of course, for all who believe, but I also want to encourage particularly those who may be suffering this morning because I think that the resurrection of Jesus can provide the perfect comfort in our lives. You might be at a point in your lives where you feel lowered, like Jesus was, where you feel descended, where you feel humiliated, even perhaps to the point of death itself. I want you to know this morning that Christ shares in your sufferings. He has shared when he was here on earth and he shares in them now. In fact, not only has he been where you have been, he wants to be there with you right now. He loves to meet us at our lowest ebb. Because as he must rise, if you call on his name too, from your suffering, you also will rise. Because ultimately, our time on this earth, like with Jesus, is temporary. And as he rises, he will take us to a place that is free from suffering and pain. As he is exalted to the highest place, we too will be honoured as his holy, blameless bride. So yes, something has happened on that resurrection day. 
consider this morning and perhaps as you go home and and this week, consider fully what has actually happened. Jesus is risen. He must rise for our sake and also for his glory. Let's just pray. Father God, we marvel at this wonderful plan of redemption. That Lord, at the foundation of this world you, you made, that between the Father and the Son you agreed that the Son would come down to this earth, would take on the form of sinful man, the form of a servant, walk among us, teach us, live a life of perfect obedience, and Lord, die an obedient death on a cross. Lord, we marvel at the decision that you made to do that and what it took, the sacrifice. Lord, the sacrifice was not just on the cross. The sacrifice was also to choose to come down and walk among us. But Lord, we thank you for this resurrection day. Lord, we believe that death could not hold you in the grave. Father God, we thank you that your spirit caused Christ to rise from the grave and now he is seated at your right hand, that he is glorified and exalted and lifted high. How majestic is our Lord Jesus Christ. How wonderful is he. Father, as we consider this amazing truth on which our entire faith stands. Lord, would you help to fortify it by your Holy Spirit and by your scriptures and by each other as the church. Help us to encourage one another in this glorious truth that he is risen and he reigns on high. And Lord, we look forward to the day when we too will rise with him, where we will be caught up and meet you at the end of all things where we will glorify you forever and ever. Amen.